Hello everyone and welcome to this overview of Greek theater flipped lesson. Today we're going to learn a little bit about uh, the history of ancient Greece and the Dionysian festival as well as the origins of Greek theater and playwrights and notable plays. Theater in ancient Greece originated in the 5th century BC and lasted through the 2nd century. In, it mainly uh, existed in Athens, Greece. Uh, if we look at our little picture where it says Attica, that is about where Athens is. Theater was created to celebrate the god Dionysus, who's pictured at the left. Now Dionysus is the god of fertility, wine, and the harvest, and later was considered the patron of theater. Once a year in Dionysus' honor, they held a festival called the City Dionysia. This was the Greek festival honoring the god Dionysus, as I've already said, and it was the most important arts festival in the ancient world. It combined theater, music, dance, and community. It was a six-day spring event in Athens and was attended by all the people from all over Greece. Now, when I say all the people, I mean all the men of Greece. As the, uh, They were women, but they were relegated to one section of the theater, which we'll talk about a little later in this lecture. The opening of the festival featured a procession to the theater of Dionysus bearing a wooden statue of the god. As the first day progressed, choruses of men and boys representing ten political tribes of Athens held dithyrambic competitions. Dithyrambs is a type of poetry which we'll also talk about later in IB. The, day, the first day of the festival concluded with a sacrifice of a bull and a communal feast because, you know, goddess, the god of uh, Dionysus liked to party a lot. The most respected playwrights would present their works over the next three days. Each would present three tragedies and one satyr play. Uh, satyr is the root word for satire, and we will talk about satyr plays a little later in this lecture as well. In 487 BC, an additional day of the competition was added with five playwrights presenting one comedy each. The judges, one from each tribe, voted on the best performance in each competition, with with prizes awarded to the uh, playwrights of the winning productions. In 534 BC, the festival's first award was given to the actor and playwright Thespis. Ever heard of the term thespian, my little actors and actresses? Well, that term comes from Thespis, who was the first actor to step out of the chorus, and we'll talk about him later as well. What was his first prize? He won uh, a goat. The word tragedy translates literally as goat song. Very interesting. On the final day of the festival, judges announced the winners and awarded the prizes. Uh, the biggest prize other than the goat being an ivy wreath for first place. The festival was also an opportunity for a meeting of Athenian legislative body. As part of the meeting, Athenian citizens evaluated the festival, the performance, and began planning next year's event. Now, just so you have some context, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the structure of Greek society very briefly. Now, after the Greek Dark Ages, much earlier than what we've been talking about, villages started to band together, in part for protection, but more importantly for a more organized set, uh, situation of trade. So these groups of villages banded together, um, and they called themselves city-states, or the Greek word polis. Now you re may recognize this word polis as a suffix that we still use today. Even our city Annapolis has this word polis in it, just means like a small city. Now each city-state had its own form of government and its own army, and sometimes its own navy, navy if it was on the coast. It definitely had its own way of doing things. Um, but the one thing that they all had in common was they all spoke the same language, they believed in the same gods, and they all worshipped the same way. So in essence, they all thought of themselves as Greeks, but they were loyal to their city-states. So what the Dionysian festival allowed was a chance for all of these leaders, all of these city-states, all the free men of these city-states to come in and um, enjoy this week of theater, enjoy this competition between city-states and playwrights, but it also was a meeting place for ideas and an exchange 
of um, philosophy. The next thing I want to talk about is a little bit of the structure of a Greek theater. Now, I've capitalized the ER to show the difference between the fact that we're not talking about the concept of theater or a piece of theater, which would be spelled R-E, but we're talking about the physical building. Beautifully designed into panoramic hillsides, the open-air theaters of ancient Greece demonstrated a command of architecture and acoustics existing as vast communal spaces where performances could be seen and heard clearly from every possible seat. All men attending the theater, whether women could attend is still debated, entered through the parados, which we'll talk about in a moment, the same ground-level entrances used by the chorus and actors during the performance. But being a citizen with wealth and power had advantages. Priests and important statesmen would sit in marble throne-like chairs engraved with their names situated in a semicircle around the orchestra, which as you can see, sort of looks like where we put our orchestra today. The orchestra was the circular area of hard packed earth where the chorus sang, danced, or engaged with actors. So this was really the first front row seats. These prime orchestra level seats gave the best courtside views of the performance. Average citizens would sit in the theatron, which was the main viewing area and could hold up to 20,000 people. The very poor, whose admission would have been paid by the state, climbed up to the nosebleed section, from where the actors appeared only an inch tall. Fortunately, thanks to the elaborate masks worn on stage and the excellent acoustics of the theater, all spectators were able to follow most of the action. Unfortunately, the cheap seats probably didn't get any of the fruit and nuts that were sometimes thrown out to the spectators during comedic plays. Now let's talk a little bit about the actual anatomy of a Greek theater. Now the word theater is actually a Greek word. Uh, It comes from the root thea. Now as the art form of theater evolved and grew in importance, especially with this city Dionysia festival, so did the theaters. This resulted in an influential architectural design that spread throughout the ancient world and is sustained today in the contemporary world. We can see this uh, when you look at Roman theater, those of you who may study that for one of your independent projects. Uh, It's almost the same exact structure. Um, And we can see this uh, Colosseum idea. It's almost half of a Colosseum uh, that the Romans use and that we still use today with um, modern sporting events. Um, So you still sort of have this idea Uh, We use a lot of the conventions of Greek theater today. Now, since we've talked about it before, uh, let's talk about the parados, which um, was the entranceway. It literally means way on. And not only did the spectators walk into the theater through the parados, but this was where the action began when the chorus first entered. You might notice sort of the word parade is in the term. In fact, this was such an important structure of the theater that it actually named uh, a part of the script. The entrance song of the chorus and their exit song were both called, well, the the entrance song was called the Parados and the exit song was called the Exodus. So um, you can sort of see how language really came from Greek theater and just the the idea um, uh, that we still use today Uh, comes from these Greek theater structures. Now the next part we're going to talk about is the isodoi. And this was just the ground area which was ramped up uh, that either the chorus would walk through uh, to get to the orchestra or the spectators would walk through to get to their seats. It's located just between the skena and the theatron. Whoop! Sorry, wrong button. Uh, the theatron, which is pictured right here. Um, So it's mostly just a ramped area. All right, next up we have the orchestra, which we have already mentioned. Um, Now the orchestra would be the flat area and it might be a circle or other shape with an altar. And the technical term for the altar is called the thymele. The thymele would be at the center, as you can see pictured with the arrow. It was a place where the chorus performed and danced, yes, which we've mentioned, um, and it was located in the hollow of a hill. Now let's talk about the theater behind the orchestra, or the building, I should say. This area in front was called the Proskenion. The whole building was called the Skena. 
Now this building pictured right here, um, and including the whole, including the whole of the building, is called the Skena. Now there are three parts to the Skena. The first one, as we mentioned, is the Proskenian, which is this front entrance way uh, leading from the orchestra into the Skena. The Logian was the sort of the roof uh, on top of the Proskena. Uh, think of it sort of as a balcony area. If you went up into the upper level of the Episcenian, um, you would walk out onto this Logian area, uh, so it was definitely raised a little bit. And finally, this upper level, the Episcenian, uh, was the upper story of the Skena, um, and uh, literally it means tent. Uh, but what this whole area was used for was a couple of things, this whole Skena. Uh, actors would use it as a changing area, um, and later um, the, the actors and the plays would use this area to sort of set the scene. Uh, it could be used sort of as a palace. Um, We'll talk a little bit later about the conventions of theater, and they did have some special effects, and they used the Skena to achieve that. Now, as we talked a little bit earlier about the um, front row seats, that's what this prohedria was, okay? So originally it started out as wooden seats, uh, it came later to be stone seating depending on the, the newness of the theater. Now let's talk a little bit about the audience area. Now, in order to get to your seat, if you were more common folk or um, poorer, uh, you would use these climaques, which is basically just the stairway. We see them today in our um, stadiums as well as our theaters. Uh, so it's just the stairway. Now, as we've mentioned before, the theatron was the whole of the theater and, and primarily these front row seats are, well, sort of mid uh, section. So we would have, uh, by today's standards, we'd have our ooh, um, our orchestra, um, and then, you know, we go to our sort of first mezzanine. Uh, this level right here is the diazema, and it was just a, a an aisle that's uh, separated sort of the middle class, which would be here, from the much poorer here. And finally, the uh, nosebleed, so to speak, this was the epitheatron, or the upper theatron, um, and we've pretty much said everything there is to say about it. These were the seats reserved for um, the poorest people in, um, or the poorest men in the city states. Now I want to take just a brief moment to talk about who would sort of sit where. Um, now, as you can see, we have one, two, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine sections, oh wait, wait, I think I'm missing a tenth in there somewhere, um, of this theater. And generally speaking, each section would be reserved for a specific city-state. So you would sit with your people. Uh, now, there is some debate among scholars as to whether women would um, come to, to the theater. Uh, it seems uh, most reports say that in uh, later years, um, closer to the present time, women did attend, but they all sat together regardless of city-state. So um, you would basically have this sort of quadrant. Um, oh, it's not really one of four, but nine-drenth, ten-drenth. Um, I'm not a math person, as you children well know, would be taken up by uh, the women of Greece. Now, I'm sure you're all fascinated to know about the actual performers. So let's talk a little bit about the players. More than a thousand performing artists took part in the Festival of Dionysus, um, but none of these performers were originally considered actors. Uh, in fact, the festival sort of started out more as like a dance recital of sorts. Now, the first form of performance was um, different members of these city-states uh, performing dithrams. Now, a dithram was an ancient Greek hymn uh, which was sung and danced in honor of Dionysus. Now, Plutarch, who some of you may have heard of, um, but for those of you who don't, he was an influential Greek figure at the time, and he wrote that, um, to describe the dithyrms, that they were wild and ecstatic um, and, and almost sort of pagan 
um, in terms of our understanding, uh, but very in line with Greek tradition and culture and the way that they celebrated their gods. Um, Aristotle, who's an important Greek philosopher, um, he said that the dithram was uh, the origin of Athenian tragedy. So this is where we first get um, the idea of we, we move from a dance um, and sort of a pagan ritual into an actual um, performance, uh, a, a written piece, um, this idea of Athenian tragedy, which we'll talk about in a moment. Now, dithrams were first sung by choirs at Delos, which is pictured right here. Uh, but the literary fragments that have survived are largely Athenian because they came, of course, from the city Dionysia festival in Athens. And in Athens, dithrams were sung by Greek choirs, um, which were made up of 50 men or boys dancing in a circular formation, um, as pictured in our special little picture right uh, at the top left of your screen. Um, now, it's uh, debated whether or not the men and boys dressed as satyrs. Now, a satyr is a half man, half goat, and um, sort of the um, lackeys of Dionysus. Uh, pictured in the bottom right, you'll see um, an image from a Greek vase um, of this event of uh, men and boys dancing uh, these uh, dithrams dressed uh, as satyrs. In any case, uh, dithrams moved from a really religious um, sort of practice into the idea of a choral dance performance uh, done at the early festivals into an idea of drama. And, and really the way that that happened was through the actor Thespis. Now, prior to Thespis, at the city Dionysia, um, these chorus of boys and men, 50 in total, would, would chant the dithrams in unison. Now, they were led by a choreagos, uh, a lead chorus member, um, and they were accompanied by um, musicians playing um, a wind-like instrument sim similar to an oboe today. But by 534 BC, the poet Thespis began performing a specific role distinct from the chorus in his plays, and he established the basic concept of an actor. Um, like I said, today we call actors thespians, and it's from Thespis. Um, the works of other Greek poets, such as the Odyssey and the Iliad, were also influential in the evolution of theatrical performance. Um, and they, they allowed, uh, or they provided a template for um, rhythmic line and delivery. So even, uh, at, at we, we move from this sort of chanting of a dithrum into a more poetic structure, similar to Shakespeare uh, and his writing. Now, after uh, Thespis steps out of the chorus, uh, we begin to see a lot of changes ha happening rapidly in Greek theater. There's the, the first of which is the structure of Greek tragedy. Now, uh, as it began, uh, poets for this festival would write three tragedies in a series. Um, so those of you who have read Antigone will know that, um, or should know, that the first uh, episode of that tragedy is really about her father, Oedipus, and how he become, begins to become king. The second is Oedipus Rex, which we'll look at later uh, in this school year, and it's the tragedy of Oedipus. And the final installment is Antigone, uh, which is about his daughter and the repercussions, um, how the sins of the father are visited on Antigone. Now, in addition to these three tragedies, which were performed in succession, they would be capped by a satyr play, which was simply a satire, sometimes related to the tragedies, sometimes uh, as just a light comic piece following. So again, with the addition of an actor to the chorus, a new type of theater developed, just like I said, tragedies, comedies, and satyr plays, which each required choruses of different sizes. So now they're really experimenting with the, with the um, parameters and the structure of how theater was performed. Now, a little later in this lecture, we'll talk specifically about the four most influential playwrights, but I want to talk, uh, hit on them briefly, a few of them briefly right now. Now, Aeschylus was a playwright in uh, Greece, and um, he is the first person to introduce two actors. So we have Thespis, who, oh, excuse me, um, who really moved uh, one guy out of the chorus. Aeschylus adds two, so you have interplay as opposed to monologue uh, choir chanting, monologue choir chanting. Now you have scenes with the chorus uh, providing um, sort of the role of 
the ensemble, but they're also able to comment on the story. Now, Sophocles took it a step further and added three actors. He also was the first playwright not to perform in his own plays, which was the convention of the day. He used professional actors. Um, so he really sort of shifted the focus away from um, the chorus and used them as a supporting tool for the actual actors who were um, creating the scenes and dialogue. Now, because they were only using two or three actors in order to create all these characters, um, the actors were required to wear masks um, so that they could take on these multiple roles. Now, masks serve several important purposes in ancient Greek theater. Um, first of all, the exaggerated expressions, which helped to define the characters the actors were playing, and they also allowed um, actors to play more than one role, including differentiating gender as well as status. Additionally, uh, they were so large that they uh, projected all the way up to the audience members in the most distant seats so that they could see faces um, as opposed to trying to distinguish um, facial features from so, so far away. And because megaphones were built into the masks, they, excuse me, um, allowed the audience members far away to hear the sound projected this, in addition to the excellent acoustics of the theater, uh, allowed every person in the um, audience to hear the play, which is pretty impressive in a non-technological age. Now, in a tragedy, the masks were a little more lifelike. But in a comedy, the features would be much more exaggerated, um, even grotesque. Uh, let me grab my arrow such as this one pictured here. The masks were made of lightweight materials such as wood, linen, cork, and sometimes real hair. Um, unfortunately, they weren't very durable, so none of them have survived. Um, most of what we understand about the masks um, come from uh, sculpture and uh, vase carvings and, and paintings. Costumes, along with the masks and props, helped to indicate social status, gender, and age of a character. Uh, generally speaking, Athenian characters were more elaborate, decorated versions of everyday clothing. Um, you'll have a basic tunic, um, which would be your undergarment. Um, the Greeks called those chitons or peplos. Um, and a cloak um, or overgarment, which uh, can be seen on our little chorus over here. Uh, which was a hymation. Pictured at the far left, we have a chiton, uh, which was basically a tunic with sleeves. Uh, in the center, we have a peplos, which is a tunic without sleeves. It's a little more feminine. And finally, the hymation, which was sort of what you all would think of maybe as a toga, which is just a wrapped garment, uh, obviously mostly for men. Now, if you were playing a non-Athenian character, your costume would be more outlandish. Tragic actors would wear these buskins, uh, which are these raised platform shoes pictures, uh, to symbolize their superior status, um, while comic actors would wear just plain socks. Um, when they were depicting women, actors would wear body stockings, uh, with, uh, which would have uh, padding to make their bodies appear more feminine. Um, some plays even called for actors to wear animal costumes. Um, so as you can tell, probably all actors were men at this time. Now, for the most part, props were fairly straightforward. Um, in addition to masks, they used them to create character. Um, it could be as simple as a crown to represent a king um, or a lyre for a musician, a walking stick, uh, which would suggest age of a character. Um, spears or helmets could suggest military. Um, a, prox a props maker would create and provide these to actors. Um, they also, props could be used for symbolism. Um, one example would be in the Greek play Agamemnon. Um, the script mentions a red carpet that Agamemnon walks on when he returns home from war, the red signifying the blood that he spilled at Troy. However, there are two specific special props I want to talk about. Now, an echiklema, which literally means to wheel out, uh, was a large wheeled platform that could be rolled um, out onto the stage or the uh, proscanian 
um, to display scenes that had taken place beyond the view of spectators. Now, you'll understand this when we read Oedipus a little bit more, but the Greeks believed that the theater should stay clean and no violence should actually be depicted. So when certain um, action happens, wherever blood is shed, it happens off stage and you hear characters describe what happened um, and then you they would roll this ekeklema on um, and you could see the results, but you would never see the battle um, or the actual um, act of killing or whatever it might may be. Now, the next important piece that they um, built was the mechane, which literally means machine. It was a, a crane-like device that was used to lift actors and allowed them to appear in the air or to enter dramatically from behind the skena, uh, which was... Um, really a common way of portraying gods. So you could sort of fly actors um, above the stage, which is pretty impressive. Um, if you've ever heard of the term deus ex machina, it's God out of machine. Um, and that's literally where it comes from. Now in the sixth century BC, a Greek playwright functioned not only as an artist, but as a cultural historian. Uh, through their tragedies, they defined factual history for the masses. They drafted a commonly accepted, right or wrong, record of Greek society. Um, tragedies of Aeschylus, who is pictured right here. Um, Sophocles, who is right there. Um, uh, and Euripides. Um, there are trage tragedians. Um, along with um, epic poetry of Homer, who was not a playwright, of course, but a poet. He wrote the Iliad. Um, they were frequently grounded in factual events. Real-life kings and wars mingled easily with the gods and mythological creatures, creating a Greek culture and heritage that was part of history and part of fantasy. But tragedies rarely dealt with current events. Uh, that was the domain of comedy. Popular comedies of our good friend right here, Mr. Aristophanes, uh, would satirize public officials and even other playwrights to great acclaim. The ancient Greek tradition of comedic and social satire can be found in the works of influential playwrights such as Shakespeare um, and even Samuel Beckett. Uh, today, it's common for a playwright to address contemporary issues through drama as well as comedy, either directly or, or through metaphor. So to summarize, basically, our good friends uh, Aeschylus, Euripides, um, and Sophocles, they wrote tragedies, and these tragedies were based on factual events, but they were um, legends, histories. They happened long, long ago. Um, whereas our good friend Aristophanes would take a public event uh, or a, a current event, I should say, and, and use it to address a social issue. Um, and you probably see that a lot to, today in the contemporary plays um, that you've seen or been involved with. Now, um, Aeschylus, uh, who uh, was around from 525 to 455, BC. Um, he was a prolific playwright as well as a poet, and he created over 80 plays. Now, even though he wrote over 80 plays, only a handful have survived to this day. He was also extremely successful. He won top festival honors over a dozen times. Um, the three tragedies in his trilogy, Orestia, uh, deal with the concept of vengeance versus justice and breaking the cycle of violence. Now, if you see um, at the right of your screen, uh, an artistic depiction of Orestes uh, slaying um, Agisthus and Clytemnestra, who uh, were characters who were featured in the Orestia. Um, Aeschylus was also an actor, and he helped advance the development of scenery and costuming through his plays. So kudos to our good guy, Aeschylus. You may also remember um, that Aeschylus was uh, the playwright who uh, followed Thespis's lead and moved uh, two actors and along with the chorus. Now, originally Sophocles uh, was an actor, uh, but due to a weak voice, he gave it up and instead became the first poet to exclusively write rather than perform, which we mentioned earlier. Uh, the plays of Sophocles were frequent festival winners, popular with judges and audiences alike. The Greek philosopher Aristotle credits Sophocles for increasing the number of actors from two to three and the chorus to 13. So he built up the size of the... Um, actors to three, but he shrunk the chorus to 13. Um, Antigone, Electra, and Oedipus Rex are among Sophocles' most famous tragedies. And you can see this picture 
uh, in the center of Oedipus um, in the famous last scene, which I won't give away the plot yet. Now, Euripides was just as prolific as Aeschylus and Sophocles, um, but he did not enjoy the same level of success in his lifetime. Um, he inserted more social commentary than usual uh, in his plays. His tragedy, Medea, um, Euripides, it, I'm sorry, in his tragedy, Medea, Euripides created one of the first strong female main characters, um, driven to misguided vengeance by her fury rather than by fate. Fortunately, a large number of his plays, 18 tragedies and one satyr play, survived, and his work became popular in the second century. And finally, my man Aristophanes. The plays of Aristophanes helped to, def to define old comedy, where unlike tragedy, the chorus and actors interact directly with the audience. Also, unlike tragedies... Um, I'm sorry, unlike the tra tragedians whose plays often focused on historical events played out within the context of myths and legends, Aristophanes' plays satirize contemporary subjects, which we've mentioned, um, and, and they characterize, caricaturized real people, including Euripides, Sophocles, and Aeschylus, the playwrights we just mentioned. Uh, of his more than 40 plays, 11 only survive today, and he only received six festival victories. In 405, um, his uh, B.C., his play The Frogs, which is an episomic buddy comedy about traveling through Hades, was so well-received, well it won an unprecedented second performance in the next year's festival. Um, so, again, he wrote um, The Frogs, The Clouds, and my personal favorite, uh, Lysistrata, uh, which I'm sure all of you will appreciate. It's basically where all the women of the... Um, fighting armies of Troy and Athens decide that they're going to end the war by withholding sex from their husbands. Uh, so it's a pretty funny play and a good satire. As depicted in the traditional masks that represent theater, plays in ancient Greece fell into two broad categories, and I'm sure you can guess them by now, tragedy and comedy. Both types were presented and celebrated in the Dionysian festival, and each uh, served a very different purpose in the performing arts of Greece. Now, in his essay, The Poetics, Aristotle discusses uh, the perfect structure of a well-made play, which we now know as our classic drama structure. And any of you who've taken a literature class have probably seen something similar to this diagram pictured on the screen. Now, in the tragedies of Aeschylus, Euripides, and Sophocles, they follow these strict, this strict structure and form, and it was specifically designed to effectively communicate not only the story of the play, but also the underlying moral to the audience. So, a typical ancient Greek tragedy consisted of five essential sections, some of which are repeated as necessary to accommodate the plot. Now, what we know as exposition would be achieved by two items. The first would be the prologue, which would either be a monologue or dialogue presenting the tragedy's topic. Now, you might, um, if you think back to any version of Romeo and Juliet you've read, um, it starts with the prologue. Uh, these two houses, uh, blood is going to be shed. He kind of gives you an overview of the whole plot so you know what to expect and what the moral is going to be. It's taken straight from Greek theater, that um, idea. Now, what basically has become our exposition today, that would have been the parados, which was the entry of the chorus through the parados um, using unison chant and dance. Uh, they would explain what has happened leading up to this point. You will notice this when you read Oedipus. The, the chorus sort of literally gives you the history of um, the town up to that point and why um, tragedy has befallen the city and Oedipus needs to do something about it. Now... From the initial conflict through the, parite the peripatia, or um, the denouement, the, the climax, um, the crisis moment, uh, is the main action of the play, obviously. And, and we called this, uh, or the Greeks called this episodes. So sort of each moment, the, the conflict, that would be an episode. The reversal, uh, that would be an episode. The climax would be an episode. The peripatia would be an episode. And so you get this episodic sort of act-like structure within the play, which is, was only one act, um, and during which the chorus would have um, interactions. Um, 
So even though most of the plot's occurring here and the actors are speaking dialogue and, and they're advancing the plot, um, the chorus and the chorus would interact. In between those, uh, we would have the next bit, which is called the stasimon. So, for example, you would have this, the episode that would lead to the initial conflict. Boom, we have conflict. The chorus would come out and sort of recap and comment on the action of the conflict. Then the actors would come back out. Boom, 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 boom. We go up to the reversal. Ugh. Then the chorus comes back out and they summarize and comment. So all of these summaries and comments are this stasimon. And finally, the exodus, which would um, be the last moment of the play. It's the final chorus chant where the chorus uh, explains the moral of the tragedy or they discuss it. Um, so in this way, you sort of have, you have drama, you have action, but you have this idea of society who is sort of a part of the play, but they're mostly commentors. So you're seeing all the tragedy happen to the actors um, and you're getting a lesson from your community about what the, what the uh, play itself is about. Now this sort of brings us to the end of our um, discussion about, uh, the, about Greek theater. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about this dramatic structure, specifically when we talk about Oedipus Rex. Um, I hope you really enjoy the text, and thank you for listening.